Hallelujah. It is such a great time and exciting time because it is not just one time that we get a chance to um, celebrate um, Sunday, gathering with each other and gathering around our, our living rooms with our family, but we also get to celebrate the risen King once more and again. This is nothing new for us because we want to celebrate him all the time because he has risen and he has all power in his hands. And on that note, in um, John 20, it says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among, among them. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his sides, and they were filled. They were filled. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Anybody else be filled with joy when you see the Lord? Hallelujah. And God, we want you to show your presence on today. Father, fall afresh on our families. Fall afresh on, our, on everything, on our atmosphere, oh God. Only you, God, can intervene and divinely right everything that is going wrong in the world today. So God, we're standing on the promises that you've made. We're standing on the fact that you will see us through. We're standing on the fact that you have everything in your hands. God, we bless you. We glorify you. We lift you up. No other God like you. And we serve you, Lord, because you're true to your word. You're true to who you are. You're true to all things. God, you are a good God. You are faithful. You are relevant. You are eternal, God, and we bless you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we seal this with an amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's go up a little bit higher. We came to love on the Lord. We came to give him glory. We came to magnify him because there's no other God like him. Come on, put your hands together right where you are. Say your love, your love is greater than now. 
help me sing it. One voice say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won. You have won the victory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won it all. again you have you have won the victory come on declare it real big hallelujah music everybody lift your voice and say hallelujah hallelujah you have won you have won the victory God we declare victory in your name If you're glad that he won it all for you, come on, begin to bless the Lord right where you're sitting at. Come on, have a moment of worship. Let's go ahead and bless the Lord right where you are. God, we thank you. We magnify you. We honor you, God, for dying, for raising, for being there for us, for being in our place, for making the greatest change. God, we worship you. God, we worship you. God, we worship you. Hallelujah! 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 To the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the Great I Am, to the Sovereign One, to the All Sufficient One! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah!
continue to worship the Lord in your individual places of worship in your homes. Please know that we are connected. We're connected by the blood of Jesus Christ. And about this time, if you were sitting in this congregation, sitting in this church right now, it will be prayer time. And then I would ask you to come to the throne, or to come to the altar. And so I'm going to walk down to this altar vicariously uh, for you. And I would ask that you would find a place, as if it, you're watching on your phone, if you're, you're watching in your living room, if you're, if you're watching um, in your car, wherever you are, that you would get a place that you can just surrender to the Lord, that you can cast all your burdens unto him. And so as I walk down these steps, I'm symbolically walking down with you to this altar as we take it to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Master, Lord, how we thank you. We praise your holy name, Father God. There is none like you, Lord. You are awesome in all your ways and awesome in all your works, Father God. Lord, we cannot thank you enough, Lord. Father God, everything that we have, Lord, is because of you, Father God. If we had 10,000 tongues, Lord, we could not praise you enough, Father God. And Father God, although we are separated physically, Lord, we thank your holy name, Lord, that we are connected, Lord, spiritually. We thank you, Lord, for your darling son, Jesus Christ, who died on the, the cross for our sins, Father God. And so right now, Lord, we just ask that you would have your way, Lord, as we worship in our individual areas, Father God. We might be observing social distancing, Father God, but Lord, we are not alone, Lord, because Lord, you are with us, Father God. You are very present help in time of need and struggle, Father God. So Lord, right now, Lord, that you would stop by, Lord, every home, Lord, every hospital bed, Father God, every rehabilitation center, Father God. Lord, we ask right now that you would touch all of our doctors and nurses, Father God. Those who we call essential personnel, Lord, that are standing in the gap, Lord. Those who are working at, at grocery stores, Father God. Those who are working at uh, uh, restaurants and, 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 and McDonald's, Lord, in different areas, Father God, that may not know what tomorrow may bring, Father God. Their life, they feel like they're putting their life on the line every day, Father God. But Lord, allow them to rest their cares upon you, Lord. Lord, as I kneel at this altar, Father God, Lord, I present every care, Lord, for those who are connected, Lord, even those who are watching on demand later on, Father God. Touch homes, Lord. Touch households, Father God. Touch marriages, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Touch finances, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for the victory, Lord, in advance, Lord, what you're going to do, Lord. And Father God, let we will be remiss, Lord, if we forgot what this day is, Father God. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, the same power that brought Jesus back to life, the same Jesus, the same power that brought Jesus up, Father God, is the same power, Lord, that will restore this nation. It's the same power that will restore this earth, Father God. And we thank you, Lord, in advance. Lord, we thank you for the word that's about to go forth, Lord. Touch our pastor, Lord, in a mighty way. We thank you, Lord, how I've used him, Lord, in a mighty way, Lord, over these weeks, Father God. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that one day, we will be able to enter these doors, Father God, and celebrate and worship your holy name, Lord. We honor you, Father God, in all that we do, Father God, with our gifts, Father God. Lord, we understand that every member is a minister, Father God. So we accept, Lord, the responsibility of ministry, Lord, in our everyday activities, Lord. The things that we post, Lord, online, Father God. The interactions that we have, Lord. The words that we speak off of our families, Father God. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to have your way, Lord, as we end this season of sacrifice, Lord, giving you all honor and all praise. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen.
Just one word will do. God, it will remove all the doubt. God, it will remove all the doubt. It will remove fear, Lord. It will change our minds. It will change our hearts. It will change the way we walk. It will change the way we talk. One word, Lord. One word, Lord. One word, Lord. One word, Lord. Oh, we need one word. Oh, we need one word. Father God, we come now on this resurrection morning thanking you for the good news of the resurrection. We thank you, God, that even though Friday looked bad and even though Friday had placed a question mark in the bosom of the sky, God, we thank you that Resurrection morning, you erased the question mark and put an exclamation mark. Oh, we thank you, God, for our resurrected Lord. And we thank you now for the power of the resurrection that is available to us right now. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead can resurrect our dead lives and transform our hearts and souls. Oh God, we bless your name now and we give you the glory, we give you the honor. Oh God, we've come on resurrection day to lift up your high and holy name. We thank you now for the finished work of salvation. We thank you for the atoning work of Jesus the Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you, God, all oh, that you didn't leave us in the state we were in but you gave us your only begotten son to live among us to die for us to be buried in the tomb but to be raised on the third day morning and now God we thank you for the victory we have in Christ Jesus we know that Satan has been defeated and the grave has lost its victory oh God we thank you now that death has been swallowed up in victory and that we have the victory on today. And now, Lord, I pray that you'll anoint me afresh and that you'll use me now for your glory and for your honor. God, I pray right now for a fresh anointing. And then, God, give me a rhema word that will inspire and that will encourage, a word that will uplift and enlighten the hearts of your people, that sinners might be saved, that backsliders might be restored and that the saints of God might be edified in the name of Jesus we do pray and we do say amen and amen hallelujah to your name God bless we greet you on this resurrection Sunday and we thank God for you on today and we pray God's blessings upon you. And I know that this is an unusual experience, but we'll look back in history and realize that God kept us in the midst of a pandemic. We never imagined being exposed to a global pandemic, nor could we even begin to imagine what it would be like to live in the midst and to live through a pandemic. 
but God has made us a part of this history that years from now, decades from now, generations will look back and wonder, how did we make it? What did we do to survive? What kept us going? But we'll be able to testify that it was through the grace of God that we survived the pandemic. And in the midst of the pandemic, we kept our praises going. And so it's definitely unusual not to be physically in the house of God on Resurrection Sunday. But the good news is the church resides within our hearts. And so wherever the people of God are, the church is there. And we thank God for that on today. There is a word I have for you on this Resurrection Sunday. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse number 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, mm -mm, they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish one, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. 
But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road. And how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. I want to talk today from this subject. I never thought I'd see the day. I never thought I'd see the day. I want to borrow this subject from a book I read by Dr. David Jeremiah. The book is entitled, I Never Thought I'd See the Day. Dr. David Jeremiah, in this book, addresses culture at the crossroads. As we think about culture at the, at the crossroads, it also is a reminder to us that as we deal with the coronavirus and this pandemic, we are at a crossroad. The question for us is how do we handle the crossroads of life? You remember the Wizard of Oz? You remember Toto? Toto said, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And with that famous line from the movie version of L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, quite different from the Kansas of her childhood, came to question where she was. And as I look around us, and as I scan today's headlines, I'm often tempted to think, total, we're not in America anymore. And when I look at the changes that have occurred in our world, most recently in the light of this pandemic, our entire world has come to a sudden stop. We have been thrust into a new normal that we have never seen before. When I consider how church as we have known it has gone from interpersonal relationships and fellowships of the believers to an online only worship. I must confess I never thought I'd see the day. Just in our lifetime we are seeing things that we never thought we'd see. In fact, I had to pinch myself to see if it's a dream 
gone bad. Sadly, what we see is all too real. Matter of fact, every now and then, I do a double take several times a week, sometimes several times a day, as I witness more and more changes. I never thought I would see these unprecedented times demand unprecedented discernment from Christians. I think the times in which we live calls for greater discernment of what God is doing. God has used this pandemic to reorder our whole world. We have been forced to slow down and smell the roses along the way. We've been forced to stay at home and rediscover our families. We have been forced to go back to eating at home versus on the go and on the run. We have been forced to learn how to interact with our families. And that's been a challenge for so many because we perhaps have been living under the same roof with our family members, but yet living totally independent lives. But now we're, for, we're, for, we're forced to talk to one another. Uh, we've had to learn how to break out uh, the, the old-fashioned board games. We, we've had to learn how uh, to interact in the personal spaces of our home. We've had to cancel mm -hmm, our impersonal, our in-person resurrection services. And now we're left with only a stream to view the joy of the resurrection. We're living in a world like never before. A world that I could have never imagined. The unthinkable has come to pass and there is the question, will our world ever be the same again? What will the future look like? And how do we go forward as we travel the crossroads of life? Finding the new norm can be very difficult. Good news of the resurrection is that our Savior specializes in traveling the crossroad. Jesus traveled the crossroad that led him to Calvary, where he died for the sins of the world. Prior to Calvary, Christ had already met many people at their crossroads to let them know that he is the Christ of the crossroads. In fact, Jesus met Zacchaeus at a crossroad in his life. Zacchaeus was there in Jericho. He was in need of a savior and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for he knew that Jesus was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place where Zacchaeus was, he told him to come down, for today I must abide at your house. Jesus met Zacchaeus at the crossroad of his life. Jesus met that woman with the issue of blood at the crossroad of her life. She had tried every home remedy and every physician. She had tried every prescription in an attempt to get better. But in reality, her sickness only grew worse. But when she heard that Jesus was coming to town, she went down to the crossroad and she met him there on the road. She caught him by the hem of his garment and said, if, if, if I could just touch 
the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be made whole. Jesus said, somebody touch me. She said, it was I. And he said, woman, your faith has made you whole. We serve a God who specializes in the crossroad. In fact, Jesus met blind Bartimaeus at the crossroad of his life. For the Bible said that Bartimaeus was on the side of the road crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible said that Jesus stopped and asked Bartimaeus, what would you have me to do for you? Bartimaeus said, I would that I might receive my sight. And Jesus restored his sight at the crossroad of his life. In fact, Jesus met 10 lepers at the crossroad of their lives between Samaria and Galilee. And when Jesus met them, he told them to go and show themselves to the priest. And the Bible said, as they went, they were healed of their leprosy. I tell you, Jesus specializes in the crossroad. In fact, Jesus met the widow of Nan, whose son had died. They were on their way to the cemetery. Jesus stopped the funeral procession, knocked on the casket, and told that boy to get up and take care of your mama. And right there, that woman experienced the power of God at the crossroad of her life. Jesus met Jairus at the crossroad of his life. But it was Jairus who approached Jesus one day on the road and said, my daughter, is sick unto death. And I need you to come to my house and I need you to heal her. Oh, my brothers and sisters, Jesus was interrupted by that woman with the issue of blood and delayed in the process. And the word came to Jairus, trouble the master no longer. Your daughter is dead. But Jesus looked at him and said, but do you want me to go to your house? Do you still have faith? And Jairus said, come on, master. And when Jesus got to the house, he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. She was 12 years old. But thank God Jesus met Jairus at the crossroad of his life. Jesus met that woman at the well in Samaria at the crossroad of her life. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. For he knew that there was a woman in need of a savior. And by the time he finished meeting this woman at the crossroad of life, she came to know the true and living water. But Jesus said, you keep coming to this well, but you have to come back. Because whoever drinks of this well will thirst again. Oh, but if you only know the water that I have to offer, I can give it to you, and you'll never thirst again. And that woman at the well who had made a mess of her life said to Jesus, give me that living water. Oh, but then I need to tell you, Jesus healed two blind men at the crossroads outside of Jericho. And I want somebody to know this this morning as we think about the, this Resurrection Sunday that the God we serve is still meeting people at the crossroads of life. Jesus was very familiar with meeting people at the crossroads of their lives. And now on Resurrection morning, as we follow Jesus' resurrection, he meets two travelers on the road to Emmaus. And as Jesus walks with these two individuals 
on the road to Emmaus. He talks with them as they share their heartaches along the way. The two individuals were walking mm -hmm, with the answer to their heartaches and sharing their heartaches with the Savior and didn't know that it was the Christ whom they had met on the crossroad of their lives. As we travel the crossroads of this coronavirus pandemic, I want to recommend that we recognize the presence of Christ on the crossroad of our lives. The good news of the text is that Christ will meet us at the crossroads of life, but the challenge for us is to recognize his presence. As we travel the road to Emmaus with Christ and these two men, there are several lessons that we need to learn from their encounter with Christ on the crossroad of life. And so as I load my little red wagon, here they are. Here's the first one. Disappointment had blindfolded them to the reality of the resurrection. The Bible says that as these men were walking, Jesus shows up. And he starts walking with them. Jesus starts listening to their conversations. And as he listens to their conversations, he discovers that the conversation on the Emmaus Road reveals that it is hard to see beyond your hurts. For in the midst of their sadness on that morning, God the Father took great pains to minister to the needs of their hearts. And aren't you glad that the Lord cares when you hurt? He moved in several mighty ways to encourage the hearts of these saddened believers. Uh, note a few of the things he did. Uh, he rolled the stone away from the tomb. Do I have a witness? Not to let Jesus escape, but to allow man the opportunity to look in. But then he sent an angelic messenger with the good news that Jesus was alive from the dead. All my brothers and sisters, never has the world heard a message like that one, it still reverberates through the halls of time and will throughout eternity. That is, he is alive. Oh, he had a word of encouragement for Peter who had denied him. He said, tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. He met Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. She had a great love for the master and great love begets great love. And in the light of the great sorrow she experienced, in the light of the cross, she's now given the message that Jesus is alive. He left a message for his followers inside the tomb. And that was Jesus left his grave closed behind. Let me see if I can illustrate what this really means. There was a custom among Jewish people that said that the napkin 
that a man uses at the table was to signal the wait staff. When a man with his servants was eating a meal, he would use the napkin to signal them during the course of the meal. If he left the table and wadded up his napkin, it meant that he was finished and would not be back. If, however, he neatly folded the napkin, it told his servants that he was stepping away for a moment, but he would be back. Jesus was telling his disciples, I may be out of your sight right now. That's what he said on Calvary. But I will be right back. Oh, he was in the grave for three days. But thank God, resurrection morning, he said, I'm back. And the good news is the God we serve has bounced back ability. But then the conversation on the Emmaus Road reveals that it's hard to see beyond your faded hopes. In other words, as these men were walking and talking, and as Jesus asked them about what is causing you to be so sad, they said, surely you must be a stranger. For you're the only one here in Jerusalem who has not heard about how Jesus was delivered into the hands of sinful men and how he was crucified and buried. And we had hoped that he would establish Israel and that he would create an earthly kingdom. But now, our hopes ended on a cross. And I tell you, when we are disappointed, we can be talking to what we're talking about and not even know it. For they were talking to Jesus about their faded hopes, but they couldn't see beyond the blindness that the pain had caused in their lives. Can I tell you, Martha had the same experience when Lazarus had died and when Jesus shows up, she said, if you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said, but I am the resurrection, the truth and the life. Do I have a witness? Uh, Martha said, I, I know you are the resurrection and the life. And I know that in that great getting up morning, my brother's going to get up again. Jesus said to her, in essence, listen, Martha, you're talking to what you're talking about. Because I am the resurrection, the truth and the the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we find ourselves living in despair when the answer to our deliverance is right in our midst. Which leads me to suggest number two, that doubt had blindfolded them to the reality of the resurrection. Doubt had blurred their eyes to the proof of the resurrection. As the morning began to dawn on the first day of the week, after Jesus had died on the cross, some women came to the tomb to finish anointing the body of our Lord for his burial. This anointing process had been started by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. On the day our Lord died, 
while these women were heading to the tomb, our Lord's disciples were locked up inside the upper room, trembling in fear that the same kind of death that Jesus had met awaited them also. Certainly, these women were sad and the disciples were scared. Just as Jesus had said, the shepherd had been smitten and the sheep had scattered. Uh Uh-huh. Why were they so upset? They had all believed Jesus to be the Messiah. They had placed their faith in him and they had expected that he would set up his kingdom throwing off the Roman yoke of bondage. And even though he had told them of the cross and of the resurrection, they had never grasped the message or the meaning of Christ's words. Now he is dead. The one that they had placed all their hopes in was gone. This man who had so radically changed their lives by his power and had demonstrated the love and power of God to them had died a violent and humiliating death. Surely it was a sad day for his followers. As I reflect on the sadness of the disciples, I can understand their grief. Even Paul spoke about it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 12 when he said, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is without foundation. And so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But I thank God that we have the good news of the resurrection. For the Bible said, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we'd be all men most miserable. Do I have a witness? Uh Uh-huh. The Bible tells us that even though Jesus was dead on Friday, he's now alive on resurrection morning. Have I got a witness? And if Jesus hadn't got up, we'd be on our way to hell. But thank God, we've got heaven in our view. Doubt had blurred their eyes to the person of the resurrection.
they were walking with the master and didn't really know who he was. And often in our lives, we raise the question, where is God when I need him the most? But I've come to tell you, if you'll just look around, you'll discover that he's been standing there at the songwriter said, waiting patiently in line. Tell somebody he was there all the time. Doubt had blurred their eyes to the prophecies of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus started reminding these men who were traveling on the Emmaus road about how the prophecy had indicated the death of the Messiah, the burial of the Messiah, but then the resurrection of our Lord. Have I got a witness? Oh, my brothers and my sisters, so often we fear and fret because we lose our faith along the way. And every now and then, God has to remind us of what he's already said. In other words, Jesus told him about the end before the beginning ever started. Jesus told him, I'll be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Have I got a witness? I'll be crucified, buried in the grave. But on the third day morning, I'll get up again. But they forgot his words. Have I got a witness? But then finally, the Bible says that as they were journeying, the evening sat in on them. Have I got a witness? Oh, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus was about to go further. But they said to him, come on and spend the night with us. Even though they didn't know who he was. Which leads me to conclude with this third point. Discouragement had blindfolded them to the reality of the resurrection. Have I got a witness here? Their eyes were opened through their participation in the fellowship with Jesus Christ. For the Bible says that when they went in the house, Jesus sat at the table with them. He took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. Have I got a witness? It was in their participation of the fellowship that they discovered who Jesus was. Have I got a witness? My brothers and my sisters, COVID-19 has brought about the cancellation of our Easter egg hunts and the closing of our parks. We're experiencing Resurrection Sunday like never before. In the light of the stay-at-home order, we had anticipated record attendance for Resurrection Sunday as usual. But now we face the reality of empty sanctuaries and streaming platforms as our only means of connecting with one another in the light 
of the need to practice social distancing. But the real question for us is what will all of this mean to us when the stay-at-home order is lifted? Will we return to the sanctuary of God and the fellowship of the believers? It was in the midst of the fellowship that these two men discovered who Jesus was, but then their eyes were opened through their practicing of the familiar. When Jesus sat at the table, took the bread, blessed it, broke it, their eyes were open to him. Have I got a witness? Let me leave you with this. In the light of COVID-19, the sports world has shut down their seasons early. Have I got a witness? And I find it hard to wrap my mind around the fact that there are no sports events taking place, especially in the light of ESPN rebroadcasting old games. One day I pointed to a friend and said, that looks like a new game now. Have they started back playing basketball? He reminded me that everything has been shut down and that what I was watching was a rebroadcast of a previous game. Have I got a witness? But I'd never seen the game before. And that's why I thought it was new. But my friend said to me, I've already seen this game and I already know who's going to win. Go on and change the channel because this is just a repeat. This is a rebroadcast. Have I got a witness? He said, I've seen it before. Can I get a witness? And when Jesus took the bread, when he blessed the bread, when he broke the bread, all of a sudden, it triggered a thought in the minds of those men. They said, this is a rebroadcast. This is a repeat. I've seen this before. This must be the Son of God. The two people on the Emmaus Road were disoriented. Mm -hmm. to the discovery of the divine to be disoriented is to feel lost or confused people who are disoriented either don't know where they are because they've lost their sense of direction or they don't know who they are because they've lost their sense of self. Disoriented people feel confused, particularly about place and purpose. They've been reporting after so many days of being locked up in homes. People are becoming disoriented. But I've got good news for you right now. If you keep your eye on the Savior, you'll discover revelation in the midst of the situation. Have I got a witness? I'm through, y'all. But I heard somebody saying the other day that this week was going to be the worst week in the history of this pandemic that is going to be more deaths than ever before. Have I got a witness? But then I heard 
somebody else saying this week was the worst week in the life of Jesus. But the good news is resurrection morning tells us that he survived the worst week of his life. Whatever is going on in your life, I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how bad it becomes. You can survive. You can get past it. You can make it. Just look at Jesus. They crucified him one Friday, but early. Early Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. And now I can say, like the songwriter, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say I see his hand of mercy I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me he talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart ain't he all right I said, ain't he all right? Shout yeah. Shout yeah. Shout yeah. He lives. He lives. Oh, yes. trying to leave you but does he live in your life does he live in your heart do you know it do you know it ain't he all right ain't he all right shout yes shout yes oh doors of the church are open. I extend to you now the invitation to get to know our living Savior. Will you invite him into your life? You can call the number the bottom of the screen to join the St. John Church or to receive Jesus Christ. Will you come right now? God sits his son. Oh, yes. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He 
Those two men after Jesus vanished from their sight said, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Oh, what a joy it is to know that God will talk to us along the way as we deal with the crossroads of life. Oh, thank you again, Holy Ghost. Thank you for this worship experience. I pray that you've been blessed. I want to encourage you now to sow your financial seed into this ministry. As you know, the expenses of the house of God continue. And I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness concerning the house of God. Mortgage payments still has to be paid. The light bills still have to be paid. Staff, we desire to pay them insurance payments, all of the upkeep and maintenance continues on because when we come back, we want the house of God to be intact. And you've done such a marvelous job, and I want to encourage you to keep on giving, keep on sowing seeds. Oh, I tell you, I was so blessed this week as a part of our Holy Week revival. And I tell you, the evangelist did such an awesome job. Amen. The old folks said, he who does not toot his own horn, horn may not get tooted. But I sure enjoyed uh, sharing the word with you each night, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, here's how you can give. Go to the upper right-hand corner of our web page, and there's a drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner. You can give that way, or you can go to the smartphone in your hand or uh, your iPad, download the app Givelify. Set it up, look for the St. John Church of South Lake or Grand Prairie. And you can give your offering even as we're worshiping right now. And I want to thank so many of you for taking serious the responsibility of the house of God. And you've been giving through Givelify. Also, I want to thank those of you who give in a more traditional manner, meaning you like to write checks. And checks are certainly in order. Matters not how you give, just as long as you give, just get with the give. And so I've been reading names of individuals who've been giving through Givelify. And certainly I, I read these names because your giving is important and your giving is significant. In fact, Jesus called out that widow woman when she gave her offering uh, that day in the temple when others were giving large sums. Jesus recognized her might. And so I just want to use you as a source of motivation and inspiration and an encouragement to help others get with the give. And so thank you so much for those of you who've been mailing in your 
offerings. Uh, Sister Renelle Manning, we received your gift. Thank you. Sister Dorothy Hayes, uh, Ramona Joseph, Tracy Dean, Michelle uh, Ringer, Leon Kensho, uh, Shelly Lovelace, Audrey Campbell, Alice Jackson, Deidre Roseman, Denise Gabrielle, Linda Trimble. You ought to celebrate these folks that they've got an envelope and a stamp and sent their offering in. Ricky and Sharon Wade, Monty and Ingrid Ford, Charles and Belinda Charleston, amen. And I know they traditionalists because she's been a part of the praise team, still mailed it in instead of giving it when she came, amen. Fetus uh, Bankhead, Nathaniel and Regina Carter, Michelle Roberts, Carl Dorsey, Frederick and Angela Jones, John and April S. Muenda, Victor Fowler, Esther McGill. Amen. Mother McGill, she's up in Kansas City, but she's still sending back her tithe. God bless you, Mother. Michelle Woods, Vanessa Alfred, Jean and Vance Flanagan, Mr. and Mrs. William Donahue and Maddie uh, Butcham. Uh, Carolyn Alliston, Elder Charles Butler Sr., Regina Joseph, Albert Caldwell, and Regina been working on the security team and here, but she sent it in anyway, mailed it. Shirley Butler, Dorothy Williams, Arthur and Loretta Bookman, Joyce Shabazz, uh, Rediston Parker, amen, Deacon R.A. Parker, amen. Samuel James, Raphael McQuinney, Willie Williamson, Shelley Parker, uh, Samuel James, Doris Hutchinson, uh, John Rachel, Jerry, and Sharon Simmons, Dennis McQuinney, Charlie Penny, amen. He, he's on our finance team, but he mailed his tithe in. Praise the Lord, amen. Uh, Brother Thorpe, thank you. Oscar and Sharon Neal, thank you. Uh, Sister Billy Dunn, we're still praying for your health. Uh, you've mailed in your tithe. Praise God, Charles Rose, Annette Kennedy, Oh, my God. Thank you. Amen. All the way from St. Louis. Send in your tithe. Amen. Johnny and Dorothy. Uh, amen. Calhoun, thank you so much. And then Bessie James, uh, Deborah Jones, uh, Lainey Hamilton, Janice uh, Henry, LaDonna Broadway, Regina uh, Carter, and artist and Emily Thomas, uh, Fareen Tolbert, uh, Joey and Belinda Street, Joe Berry, Nicole, uh, Nicole Ellison, Bruce Ellison, David and Sharon Rivera, uh, Carrie Brown, Robin Ivory, uh, Doris Jackson, Anna Peoples, Dorothy Williams, Sonora Ward, Aletha Williamson, Clifton Lawrence and Sarah Jones, uh, Stanley Smallwood, Versi Nelson, John McNeil, Amen. Uh, Diana Jones and Dora Johnson, Linda Holmes. This is just a few. I can't call all of them, but keep on giving and know that God will reward your giving. Amen. Because you can't be God's giving no matter how hard you try. And so as we're worshiping now, let's get with the give and let's honor God with our substance. Amen. Father God, we pray now for these gifts that are being sown. We thank you for the givers and we sanctify now these gifts for your glory and for your honor. Bless your people now and supply every need in their lives. And God, we will forever give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, we do pray and we do say amen. Don't forget, Tuesday, we'll be studying the Word of God, our midweek service, Tuesday night at 7, Wednesday at noon, and then Wednesday night again at 7. I want you to stay in touch and stay in tune with another St. John Church Unleashed broadcast. I hope and pray that the joy of the resurrection will fill your life on today as you spend this day with family and friends celebrating the blessing of our resurrected Lord 
and the completion of our salvation. And may the grace of God be with you until we shall meet again. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide within each of our hearts until we shall meet again. In Jesus' name we pray and we do say amen.